And before I discuss self-referral, I want to discuss object referral, which is the opposite of self-referral. A person who is object referral is a person who refers to objects to seek his identity. So if you mean meet somebody on the street, you ask him, who are you? What do they do? The universe. If they did, you'd probably say, this guy should see a psychiatrist. When in fact they are the universe. What do they say? They start referring to objects of reference. A name is an object of reference a nationality, a street address, a bank account, the Mercedes you drive, etc. These are all objects of reference. They are the scenery, they are not the seer. So an object referral person is constantly referring to objects to seek his identity and therefore evaluates and understands and tries to know himself through the eyes of others. The characteristic ingredient is conditioned response or what we can call conditioned thinking. A person becomes a bundle of conditioned reflexes, constantly being triggered by people and circumstance, much as a Pavlovian model that salivates at the tinkle of a bell. It's exactly how 99.99% of human behavior is. You say, I love you, and he's happy. You say you such and such, and you see the expression automatically. You realize how much control you have over people's emotions. You can say anything because they're totally bundles of conditioned reflexes. And so, in fact, there's a beautiful story that I will describe to you in two minutes about a great fable from India, which is a very beautiful story about object referral. There was this old man, and he had only two things in his life that he object referred to for his identity. One was a little pony that he had and the other was his son. So those were his objects of reference in order to identify who he was. And one day the pony disappeared and so he had lost half his fortune. He was devastated and he was wallowing in the depths of his despair and crying and howling and suddenly the pony returned. And with the pony was a beautiful, gorgeous, white stallion, such as he had never seen before. A big Arabian horse. So suddenly, from the depths of despair, he was in the heights of ecstasy. And he was enjoying and celebrating his ecstasy and his good fortune. And his son was riding the beautiful white horse and fell down and broke his leg. And so from the heights of ecstasy, he was again plunged into the depths of depression. And the next day, the army was coming and they were taking all the young children to the war because they needed the young children to the war. They took all the young children, but they left his son behind because he had a broken leg. So from the depths of despair, he was in the heights of ecstasy. Now, you can see theoretically that the story doesn't have an ending. The story of object referral is without end. It is when one relinquishes one's power and one's energy to the object of reference. And according to Ayurved, this is the mistake of the intellect. This is the mistake of the intellect which makes a person a victim of the environment instead of a creator of the environment. And Ayurveda says both happiness and unhappiness are aspects of object referral. So here is a very unique distinction that the Vedic psychologists make as compared to Western psychologists. They make a subtle distinction between what we call happiness and what we call bliss. Happiness, they say, is object to fur. It's like this old man. The horse came back with a stallion, so he's happy. Or his son breaks his leg, he's sad. But now the son has broken his leg, another interpretation of the broken leg, he's happy again. So both happiness and unhappiness are as a cause of reference to objects and their interpretation. In other words, you need a reason to be happy, just like you need a reason to be unhappy. Happiness is always because of this. You're happy because you won the lottery. You're happy because you fell in love. You're happy because you got a promotion or a compliment. 
But when you have happiness for no reason whatsoever, then that is described as the state of bliss. To be happy just at the mere fact of existence is the experience of bliss. And that comes not through object referral, but through self-referral. A person who is self-referral feels wonderful regardless of the situation, circumstance of envir or environment because he has ceased to seek his identity through objects. He therefore feels no urge to prove this to anyone because if he had that urge to prove it to anyone, he would again be identifying himself through objects of reference, through other people's eyes. And this is the state of bliss. The characteristic ingredient of this is what is called silent witnessing, a higher state of consciousness where there are no labels, there are no definitions, there are no descriptions, there are no interpretations, there are no evaluations, there are no analyses, and there are no judgments. There is just the experience of silent, non-interpretive witnessing. And when one has that, then one is in that higher state of consciousness. And the Vedic literature, as described by Maharshi, describes seven stages of those evolutions. Waking, dreaming, sleeping are the three that we constantly, everybody knows of. And then, so deep sleep is the most primordial, right? Very little awareness. And then dream state, a new kind of awareness now. So it's more, more alive, more wakeful than the deep sleep. And it's very real. When you are in that deep sleep, then you are in the deep sleep. It's your reality. When you are in the dream state, it's your reality also. Nobody could convince you whilst you are dreaming that that is unreal. But when you wake up, then you say, aha, that was the dream. It's only after you wake up that you recognize the dream for what it is. Similarly, the Vedic Veda says, one wakes up from the waking state. One wakes up from the waking state into the state of the transcendent, into the state of that divine consciousness. And then that fourth state of waking up from, that occurs as a result of meditation. And as I said earlier, we specifically practice transcendental meditation to go to that fourth state. It is called Turiya. Then that is the fourth state of consciousness. The fifth state of consciousness is called cosmic consciousness where now the state of silence or the state of non-interpretive witnessing begins to seep into our dreams, begins to seep into our waking state, begins to seep into our sleep. So even though we are dreaming, sleeping or awake, doesn't matter what we are doing, we could be playing football or we could be driving a jet plane. We are doing that activity, but in the background is that silent, watchful witness, that immortal continuum of consciousness, our ground state, that, that being of immortality, the ultimate experiences. So even in the dreams it's there. There's a quality of wakefulness to the dream, to the sleep state. That's called cosmic consciousness. And beyond cosmic consciousness is God consciousness, and if we don't like the term God, we can say refined cosmic consciousness, but whatever. God consciousness is where the objects of perception, we perceive them as also having the transcendent. And this is not interpretation, it's real experience. So there is a celestial experience in everything that we perceive. And finally, unity consciousness, where the difference between the observer, the observed, and the process of observation is completely gone and one has the experiential experiential knowledge that I am everything, that I am the rainbows and I am the clouds and I am the whole universe. This experiential knowledge is the ultimate goal of complete self-referral which is the basis of Ayurveda and the Vedic tradition. So it took me all this time to give you just this very basic information. I would like to say that the information is very practical because it has, it has 
this fascinating knowledge, but there's a practicality to it. One can take that knowledge and bring about healing, not only of the physical body, not only of the mind, but the real healing, which is the healing of the return to our essential nature, which is that non-attached immortal spirit that pervades all of manifestation. And if you, if you want to know more about the practical aspects, as I said, I'd be happy to come down again and do a whole day seminar on the practical aspects. There's also an Ayurvedic doctor in the Dallas area who has been trained by our organization. And he can be contacted, he comes here once every two weeks, I believe. Uh, and he can be contacted through the local Transcendental Meditation Center or through Dr. Curtis who will have the information. And there are also Ayurvedic clinics all over the country, and you can find information about them in my books. They are listed at the back of one particular book called Perfect Health. So with that, I'd like to end, and I'd like to end with a little quote from, from one of my favorite poets, Rabindranath Tagore, who, in fact, is, was a great rishi also himself. And Tagore and Einstein, uh, two great giant of our time met in the year 1929 on the outskirts of Berlin and Einstein said to Tagore, he said there are two different conceptions of the nature of the universe. Number one, the world as a unity dependent upon humanity and number two, the world as a reality independent of the human factor. Tagore responded to that. He said, when the universe is in harmony with man the eternal, he didn't say, he didn't say the universe was eternal. He said, when the universe is in harmony with man the eternal, we know it as truth, but we feel it as beauty. We feel it as beauty. And Einstein, very much of a scientist, almost scoffingly said, that's a purely human conception of the universe. To which Tagore responded, he said, there can be no other conception. This world is a human world. The scientific view of it is also that of the scientific human being. And then, of course, Einstein said, now I know why I'm more religious than you are. <laughs> and there's another little quote from Tagore, which is beautiful, which summarizes everything I've told you this evening. Tagore says, the same stream of life that runs through my veins runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measure. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth into numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death in ebb and in flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. That experience of self-referral is what bliss is all about. So thank you for coming, and thank you for having me.